Before we get into today's video, I just want to say thank you to our Patreons. Your support helps the channel and helps fund the giveaways on the channel. If you're interested in becoming one, link down below. But without further ado, guys, let's jump right into it. What's going on, guys, and welcome back to the channel. So we're slightly changing up how we're doing a deck profile-ish video. I am going to show the deck profile, don't worry, and some replays, and we'll talk about it. However, I want to do more of a learning to play this type deck. And I know you watch replays, you commentate. What do you mean? Well, so we're doing anti-song aggro today. It's a deck I did not too, too long ago. However, we're going to talk about it a little bit more. So anti-song aggro, how is it anti-song? Well, it's an amber emerald deck that tries to win very quickly. You have things like Ursula Deceiver of All and the Bare Necessities that are early play cost cards that you can go ahead and see your opponent's hand and get rid of songs and in the case of bare necessities, items, locations, things like that, or just other action cards. So you're playing these multiple two cost cards, four of them to be exact, well, four of each, so eight of them to be exact, to get rid of things like grab your swords, like the uh, friends on the other side's a good target, and ruby amethyst, like let the storm rage on is an early card you have to look out for in that matchup as well, along with just lots of other cards. So Obviously, those are how you avoid them cards. Then we still want to aggro, quest fast, win fast. This involves things like Lilo making a wish and cursed merfolk that are one cost that quest for multiple lore. In addition to that, merfolk, your opponent has to discard if they want to take it out. So if they don't have a damage card, they need to take it out quick. It means they're going to lose a card in their hand. In addition to that, something that you can come back with like as a strong two option would be your Simba Protective Cub as a bodyguard so they can't even go after your Merfolk or your Lilo unless they have an action that allows them because the Protective Cub will protect them. Sometimes opponents don't have one drops and they don't have a turn one play. And if you go first and this happens, you have cards like Wendy Darling and Flynn Rider who can come in with more multiple lore on your turn and then you can win that way. One card I am omitting from my deck because, well, I'll tell you in a second, is Piglet. So sometimes you'll see people throw a Piglet down on turn two. Turn three, they play another character, and now you have three characters, so Piglet quests for three. It sounds really good, right? Well, it's really good when you're already building it a board and you're in a good spot. However, if you're not building a board and in a good spot, or you're like trying to close out the game and you just need a couple more lore, you're not in a good spot. Piglet, to me, is the definition of a win more card. Sure, it's good when you're doing good, but when you're not doing good, Piglet is a bad, bad card. So, for that reason, we are not playing Piglet. And this, turn three is kind of where you get interesting. Like, turn one, easy. You try to play one of your multi-questers. Turn two, if you need the protective cub, you play your bodyguard, or, like, well, I guess in our list, that's the only thing we have that we can protect our card with. Then if you don't, if our opponent doesn't come out with something or say they come down with their own merfolk because it's a very popular card this format with zero strength, you know you're safe to put that Wendy or the Flynn down. Or if you're against Steel Song and you know it, this is where you can come down with say the Ursula or the Bare Necessities to see your opponent's hand and know how to play it out better. Turn three is where it gets interesting because now if you had your bodyguard already or if you play your bodyguard now, you can do things like play a Baloo the Von Bruenwald, or you can come down with your Doc Leader of the Seven Dwarves, who's going to help you get out bigger characters a little cheaper while questing for multiple. In addition to that, Kit Cloud Kicker can remove an opponent's threat off board to help protect your lower questing card, your lower costing high questing cards, or turn three, you could say play a Flynn Rider and a Curse Merfolk if you already had the Simba and you drew into one of them. Or if you already had the Flynn on board, you could play your Simba and another Lilo, your Curse Merfolk, things like that. You can come back with a 2 and 1 cost on turn 3 to apply a lot of pressure to your opponent. As the game starts to ramp up, you can always continue playing these low cost cards. And personally, once I get to like 4 ink, I don't stop inking by any means. But if you start to get a bunch of uninkable cards in your hand, don't feel obligated to ink every time. I know it's tempting, and I know they say don't forget to ink, 
But if I fall like one to two ink behind with this deck, I'm usually not too worried because of the absurd amount of one and two drops you play. You can play multiple characters with less ink. It's not uncommon if you have, say, five or six ink to be able to play four or five characters. If you do good a little bit later, like, say, turn four, well, now is where it kind of can get interesting. There's so many options. You're opening more bodyguards like Joshua Sweat and into turn five, like your, na your Nannies, your Goofies, your Maximuses, so your bodyguard cards. Otherwise, there's also things like Tinkerbell Most Helpful who comes with evasive and can grant evasive. Not that that's going to matter for the strategy of this deck. Also, another fun card that I've had was Bernard, Brand New Agent, because when at the end of your turn, if he's exerted, you can ready a character, thus protecting them from being challenged from your opponent. Probably the best card in this entire deck is Kida, Protector of Atlantis. She's a 5-cost card, but you're playing things like Doc, and you can also do things like Pluto or Lantern to get these cards out a little bit quicker. But when she comes down, everything on board loses 3 attack, so unless your opponent shifts or plays something with Rush, they're probably not going to be able to challenge you this turn, which means by the time you get her out, you're probably going to swing for 4 to 8 lore that turn. And next turn, you're going to swing for 2 more than that, so 6 to 10. This card applies so much pressure for your opponent to answer it now, and her 5 willpower helps her stick around. In addition, you can shift her for 3. However, I will say I do not like shifting Kida. I think that by turn 3, you're never going to want to shift because you're never set up to utilize her. But by turn 5, you could save some ink and play another card in tandem with her. Yeah, yeah, you can. A lot of time, though, you don't necessarily need to vomit out your hand at this point. You usually should have a big enough board presence that it doesn't matter. And if you vomit everything out, what happens if they have grab your swords? Or you don't win in two turns and they hit you with be prepared. All of a sudden, now your hand is gone. Otherwise, you have enough presence to push for game on board. Keep those three characters in your hand. Then, if you get hit by grab your swords, play them. Now you can win again. So, other things that this deck can do, Stitch Rockstar questing for three, being able to take advantage of your one and two drops so well and draw is also very, very good. Well, we're going to go ahead now and jump on into the deck profile, and then we'll talk about some uh, matchups, and then we'll go to the replays. Oh, see if I can't do this right for you guys. Here we go. So this is my personal updated list. We are playing 13 uninkable cards. We are playing 24 twos, 14 ones, uh, 10 threes, and then we teeter off pretty quick with five fours, four fives, three sixes. You'll never guess who the fives and sixes are. So our one drops, like I said, Lilo and Merfolk, self-explanatory. We are playing aggro. I am playing Stitch, and not that you need the little dog. I just like him in there. He His 2-2, two -two, he's actually one of the cards that especially in aggro mirrors or matchups, I will go after my opponent that way. Lastly, we are playing three Pluto because you can play one less by exerting him and you are able to get out bigger characters faster for less and it just helps you in the long run. So on to our two drops. We are obviously playing four Simbas because he is our bodyguard. I really like Wendy Darling because her three willpower helps her survive things like that grab your swords and a lot of just early threats from your opponent with two strength so it helps her stick around for an extra turn flynn rider like your merfolk quest for two and your opponent has to discard if they try to challenge him however his stat line's a tiny bit better for ursula's because it's anti-song on to our threes i'm playing two baloo i have found his zero strength actually comes up to hurt in a decent amount of scenarios however Throwing that bodyguard down quick who's going to get you to lore also helps out. Not enough to play him at 4, especially because I didn't want 5, 15, sorry, uninkable cards. But at 2, I have been really liking him. For Doc, because Doc plus Pluto really just helps you flood the board and get cards out very cheap. And they also help it where you don't have to ink every turn. Kit Cloud Kicker, like I said, this is one of our cards where you can bounce your opponent's threats to help your cards be able to continue questing freely. Bernard is one of those cards that is like, I just want to try this card out, and I liked it. So we left him in there at three. Two Tinkerbell, 
because as we start to get into our four costs and higher, realistically, we don't need many of them because the game is just about over. The evasive can be the icing on the cake, though, when you come back and you're just trying to close out the game. Four Kita and three Stitch rounding out our cards, or our characters, I should say. We are playing eight songs. We have four bare necessities to be able to see our opponent's hand and get rid of those pesky songs, locations, items, and actions. And then strike a good match because we want some draw power at times and to be able to get through our deck rather quickly. So what do we do against, say, Ruby Amethyst? Well, this is a deck that a lot of time they can miss their one drop. And if they come down with it, though, it's probably Rafiki or an Olaf, something along those lines. Maybe even a Chernabog's Followers. But Chernabog's Followers, they may challenge you. However, they're going to lose him then and lose the draw. They might just quest, banish him, and be able to draw. So you could be potentially free to quest if they play a Followers. Rafiki's going to be the tricky one because you know they're always using his challenger status to quest, or not quest, to challenge your cards. And then things like Olaf or Minnie Mouse, well, they have that three willpower, so they can do things like quest or even challenge one character and then get hit with the teeth and ambition and take out another one of your characters. So do keep these types of things in mind. However, the first two turns, two, three turns against this deck can play a crucial role. If you get set up quick out the gate and you can answer their cards or protect from them, this matchup actually isn't too bad. You just race as fast as you can, and that's it. I was playing uh, Emerald Amethyst Bounce, like Tempo Bounce, but I play a little more aggressively, I guess, than the standard. Um, and in a local box tournament the other day, I had against Ruby Amethyst in, was it round two? Yeah, round two, or no, round one, it was round one. And between Maleficence and Merfolks, I was at 14 lore by turn three. And he ended up catching up, or well, I shouldn't say catching up. He ended up handling my board. But by the time he did, I was already up to 16, as 16 to zero. And I just coasted at that point. So you just try to win really quickly against Ruby Amethyst. Likewise, against red blue decks, a lot of the time they need two to three turns to set up before they start rolling. And if you can close this out by turn four or five, you will apply so much pressure to them. Do keep out for Queen, though, because Queen with Rush can actually present a threat. But her 2-2 stat line means if you get your Simba down, so do be weary about that if you're against Red, Blue. Say they come out with Popsicle turn 1. I might come back with Simba turn 2 because there is a chance that they're going to play that Queen and they will be able to rush into your Merfolk or your Lilo. So make sure you do keep an eye out for the Queen in that matchup. Not everyone's playing her, but a decent handful are. Other matchups, Steel Song. This one, um, if I know it's Steel Song, I just try to mulligan and get multiple like Bear Necessities or Ursulas, and like if I can get like between Lilo and Merfolk, this is one of the only matchups I will keep multiple Merfolk or Lilo and take that risk because you want to win very quickly. You need to win very quickly. However, I also try to get if you can get like two to three between Ursula and Bare Necessities, it is so nice, especially when you come down with Ursula turn two, turn three, you sing Bare Necessities with your Ursula and you're just getting free advantage, taking out those grab your swords, the whole new worlds, which helps them get into those types of cards and things like that. Um, green Steel. Uh, likewise, you're going after their songs. You're, you're going to try and win quick. This deck can play a little tempo early too though and they have things like Captain Hook and other challengers. So it can be tricky, but your kit can put a little more work in here because they don't really have that card that gains that inherent advantage off being played. So being able to bounce them can help quite a bit. Uh, keep an eye out for Bucky Squirrel Squeak Tutor because they're going to come after your hand. Luckily, this is a deck where between inking and playing a bunch of low-cost cards, you can get rid of your hand quick and you don't have to worry about discarding. And if you can handle those so songs that grab your swords, you should be in the clear. There's a sweet, sweet art to playing aggro. It's viable in every format ever. It's also bad in every format ever. The format goes, think of it as like waves. The format goes in waves. And you have to time your aggro right because aggro might be really bad up here. And then as the wave comes down, aggro is amazing. 
And if you go to your event and you time that out right, you can easily, easily take it down with an aggro deck. If you time it out at the wrong time when everyone's on steel, everyone's on multiple grab your swords, everyone is ready for it, not because of it, but because of other threats in the meta, you're going to have a rougher time and you might still succeed. But if you time it out right, winning with aggro is just such a fun experience. If you're wondering about tops and all that good stuff, link down below to the spreadsheet with our giveaways with all that information, deck cores, big tournaments, small tournaments, how I count my tops, all that stuff down below. Anyway, we're going to go ahead. Oh, Emerald Amethyst Bounce. Um, hmm, That deck can be tricky uh, because they're bouncing your you know, bodyguard and then challenging and taking out your other um, questers. As an avid em Emerald Amethyst tempo player, I love aggro, I like going against it. I don't struggle against aggro at all. So um, what would I do? It's good if you can have at least one of your song hitters because you don't want them drawing four. You really, really don't want them drawing four because of the friends and the Ursula. And in addition to that, being able to see their hand so you know what you need to do. Like, do they have kits in their hand? Do they have genies in your hand? Is their hand uninkables? Do they have a um, mother knows best? Are they going to be multiple bouncing your cards? Like, being able to see their hand can be very, very important. Um, I think it's a bad matchup. But, it's again, it's not unwinnable, especially if you can see their hand early. You play your hand out accordingly. Uh, you're, you're racing to the finish line. This deck is all about winning by turn 4, turn 5. If you have to, later. But, ideally, turn 4, 5. So if you can just come out swinging. Like I said, the downside is that deck also wants to come out very quickly and control the tempo. So, you might have to actually use your Simba into things like Flynn and Merfolk. To, you're going to lose part of your hand. But to control and keep sh make sure your lore stays higher because that's what that deck does. It sets the tempo early. You keep up with them, but then they start coming down with their bigger hitters and they're bouncing, and that's when they get you. So let's go ahead and jump on into some replays and talk about them. So I picked up a little helper for this part of the video. If she wants to say hi, she can. Otherwise, we will jump on into our replays. Mm. You don't want to talk? Mm -mm. Okay. So we're going to jump on into those replays. You know the drill? Tap mm -hmm. me if you want to say something. So anti-song aggro and like, or not likewise, but fitting that we play Steel Song as our first matchup. And we're going second. So opening hand, we have Doc, Kit, Stitch, Necessities, Merfolk, Tinkerbell, and Ursula. We have our one drop. We have Bare Necessities, and we have Ursula. Downside here. If they come out with a Cinderella, they can sing on their turn two to remove our Merfolk. We're kind of just going to hope that does not happen. So we get rid of Tinkerbell, Stitch. I decide to keep the kit as well and then dock. I keep the kit because it can either be ink or another way to help protect us later. However, bouncing Ariel is kind of a last resort because you don't want them singing a fives cost song, especially if they you know they hit that. The downside is... They get to play it again and dig for another song. So we hit Stitch, Flynn, and another Bear Necessities. I actually like this hand. We have th our three cards to go after them. We have our one drop, we have our Stitch, and it's just kind of how the game goes. I'm going to try and leave that over there. He inks the Cinderella. We draw the uh, Strike a Good Match, ink the Stitch, play our Merfolk. I assumed he, right here now is he's going to come down and shift a queen. So we see Ariel get inked. That to me was weird. And then he played the bare necessities, which I thought was even weirder. I was like, okay, he doesn't have the queen. If he had the queen, he would have shifted and sang it. Or I guess maybe not. But getting rid of the Ariel also to me means he has a, another Ariel. Whole new world, Benja, Cinderella, Ariel. Go figure. Hey, kind of saw that coming. So at this point, I'm like, our hand's aggressive. His hand's not very good. I'm going to go ahead and quest with that. If he wants to discard a card and take it out with his Cinderella, he can. Or with his queen. And then I will, you know, do what I can to get rid of his queen after. He does go for that. He gets rid of the Benja, so we know he has just the one card left in hand. Here, I get rid of the Simba because I feel pretty safe doing this. He has Ariel and Cinderella in hand. Dad, why did you take away... 
because I'm trying to get rid of their cards up here. He's trying to get rid of mine. We're racing to 20 points over here. So again, we know he has Ariel and Cinderella. Once again, the Cinderella comes down, just trying to prevent him from singing these songs without, uh, unless he's going to hard cast them. So to get rid of the shift potential, we crash our kit, and we play another kit to once again kind of control the tempo in a similar way to Amethyst Emerald. We do have a bodyguard, we do have another song we can sing, and we have our Flynn. What, who called you up here? That's, I don't know his name as an opponent on the computer. So now he comes down with Ariel, swings, and misses. We draw Pluto, who's just going to help us later. Um, the nice thing about Bare Necessities right there is hitting Flute. He doesn't have a song, but he does have that Robin Hood and the Cinderella. So Robin Hood could potentially cause an issue, but he draws another Ariel. The downside here now, if he hits, like, grab your swords, he can sing it with the other Ariel. So ideally, this is not a good spot to be in. He hits Let the Storm Rage on, so that's not as bad, right, because we get to keep most our board. But he draws a card, and then he goes ahead and inks the Robin Hood, which to me was great. That Robin Hood was a threat that I was trying to figure out how I was going to deal with it. And here, I'm like, I'm going to lose my kit, but that's okay. We're going to lose kit, and we're going to come down with our bodyguard. Have not a great spot, but he has one card in hand, drawing one more, obviously. Then the queen is that card. Uh, Strength of Raging Fire coming down to get rid of our Baloo. Uh, we get our two lore. Gets rid of our Pinocchio, or Pinocchio, our Pluto. So it's here I'm in an interesting spot. He's actually, it's one to eight. I got the multiple questers, but if he hits songs, I'm in trouble. And it's not necessarily looking good. So I'm thinking really hard here, like how do I want to do it? I want to see his, our discards. Really just see. I'm like, I'm going to go for Doc. And if I can't get out multiple cards next turn and potentially close this out in two turns, hope he doesn't hit anything too impactful. Our opponent now debating just as strong as we were, and lo and behold, he top decks another aerial. And lo and behold, it's grab your swords. So he gets rid of our Ursula and puts two damage on Doc, which stinks. Unfortunately for us, we draw into Kita, who is going to go so hard here for us. Debating so highly now, do I get rid of the Flynn? Do I not get rid of the Flynn? I decided to put the Flynn on board because here, before we get too far ahead, I could have quested with the Doc, inked the Flynn, played the Kita. Uh, I would be at 11 with four more on board. Instead, I was just hoping he didn't draw into, say, that song because now I can go 11, 13, play the Kita. I'm sitting at 19 then at that point. So I took a gamble on his top deck. And here we hit the Ursula anyway. Quest with our Doc, just like we were hoping for. Get that extra, um, get that extra ink in our, or the ink cost down on our Kita. Play the Kita, make everything lose three. So now we're going to go to 19 unless he draws a song to do something about it. He quests a whole bunch. We're going to go ahead and quest, 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 quest. Not play Lilo here. If we play Lilo we outright lose to grab your swords because then he'll just challenge and take out our Kita. So we don't want that. And lo and behold, grab your swords. So at this point, he also then sang the Along Came Zeus. If I was him, I would have kept it. I would have crashed the Hades, get rid of the Kita that way, keep the Along Came Zeus in case I just throw down a card on my turn. I only lose to grab your swords here. Had he kept the Along Came Zeus, he would not have been able to win. So that's why we played that out like that. One more replay, we're against Mufasa Roulette this time, and Agro again, we are going second. So Ursula is going to be absolutely useless in this matchup. Um, we might be able to hit potentially an item or location from our opponent with our bare necessities, but Ursula is going to be pretty much useless. I don't need three one drops either, so we can go ahead and get rid of two of them. Um, and apparently I decided to keep the one. So Kita being really good, Wendy, Doc, um, you know, just, why did I keep the one drops? Um, okay, never mind. I remember now. Sorry for that. We kept our two one drops because they were Merfolk. If it was another Lilo, I would have got rid of it, but this is a deck that tries to generate advantage and get draws off of things like the Mother Gothel plus Rapunzel playline and Mufasa being able to play cards from their deck. So I just wanted to make it where if he's going to be challenging me because he doesn't have removal cards, he has to lose his hand. 
that is why we did that. It makes a lot more sense when we think of it. So I do apologize. It is late. I have a lot going on, and I have kids to get ready for bed here in a second. But she wanted to do a video. So here we are. Queen gets inked. Does he come down with a two? He does not. He actually plays the bare necessities, sees our hand, but we have nothing for him. Because of this, we can go ahead now, ink, and then we're going to play our Flynn Rider. Greetings because we're polite. And next turn, we can do that whole come down with the two plus the one if we want with our Simba and the other Merfolk. What's up? I want to do the video now. You want to talk? No, I want to do the video. Um, I had an issue, not issue, I accidentally clicked Lyle Tiberius to 1 and kick Cloud Kicker at 3, and I didn't realize it until this exact moment. So, like I said, we do the whole 2 plus 1 there, and now we're sitting with 7 more on board, so we're in a really good spot. But anyway, so for this video, I was playing 1 Lyle and 2 or 3 kick Cloud Kickers. That's why he's there, which is unfortunate too, because he's uninkable, so I literally cannot use him um, for anything productive. So Shere Khan goes and takes down our Simba, and then Rapunzel allows him to draw. Works just as good as the Mother Gothel play. Here, I'm going to go ahead and get real aggressive, because all of our cards require him to discard if he's going to challenge us. We get rid of that Bernard. Unfortunately, we're not going to use him here, but now we have our Doc, so technically we're within Kita range. He has to get rid of cards, otherwise we're going to win. And the idea here was he takes out two of our cards, he discards two cards, and then we can quest with Doc, quest with Merfolk, play Arkita, everything loses three, we win on our turn. So that is the plan we're going for. Let's see if it works out. Is Shir Khan gaining that lore, attacking the Merfolk, discarding a card? He then plays the Hades, which allows him to grab that Chernabog back that he just discarded, and then Rapunzel is going to attack. Not exactly sure why he said whoops, unless he had a card that he actually needed to grab back, but nothing was going to help him in this scenario. Also, I think the Shere Khan should have took out the Flynn, but it's neither here nor there. So we quest quest, throw down the Kita, everything loses three, we kind of just show off what we have in our hand, and then our opponent admits defeat. So that's some replays, that's the deck, that's some matchups. Do you guys like this format of video more or less? Let me know down below and thanks for watching.